Hello and welcome to Battersea Park in London. So we're here today to look at the history of Battersea Park. And while we're here, we're going to take a look at the festival site. But before we do any exploring, let's look at how the festival came to be in this park. Battersea Park opened in 1865 as a Victorian Royal Park. I've covered the early years in a previous video already on the channel. The Festival of Britain came to the park in 1951. It was originally envisioned as a celebration of the centenary of the Great Exhibition of 1851, or the Crystal Palace. It mainly transformed the northern and central sections of the park towards the River Thames, on land previously used as allotments during the war and existing sections of the Victorian Park that needed revitalising. It was one of two sites for the festival, with the main exhibition site being located on the South Bank in central London. The one at Battersea was unlike any other festival of Britain. This one focused mainly on fun and the lighter side of the festival, and not the serious tone it usually encouraged. Initially it wasn't met with great enthusiasm and was deemed by many as a waste of money after the war. The original budget was slashed in half and it needed commercial sponsorships to get it fully funded and to fulfil their vision. It was designed by James Gardner and many other individuals who designed their own unique attractions within the park. These would be self-funded and profitable attractions that all contributed to the offerings of the festival as a whole. The festival site was split into various zones, with each bringing something different and unique. The riverside area was used to bring people into the event via boats on the River Thames. It featured a large pier and terrace walk along the river. The parade was the main shopping area. It was known as the Bond Street of the Gardens, with luxury and quality shops along its full length. Selling anything from antiques, clothing, china and jewellery to rare international items. It featured a tree walk, a raised walkway among the tops of the trees, and the famous Guinness sponsored festival clock. The Grand Vista was the main festival display area. It was meant to emulate the Grand Vistas of Paris. With 200 foot long fountain basins and a central walkway between them, this led to two Gothic towers that housed shops and statues and ending at the large fountain lake with its grand side fountains and firework platform. Located at the end of the Grand Vista was the far tottering and Oyster Creek Railway. This was a Roland Emmett designed 500 yard 15 inch gauge miniature railway that ferried passengers between two stations. It was based on a cartoon series and had three engines called Neptune, Wild Goose and Nelly. The railway was so popular, it recouped its costs within three weeks. It was brought to life by a Mr Harry Barlow, who owned and operated the Lakeside Miniature Railway that still runs today in Southport. Although the engines looked and ran as steam engines, they were in fact diesel electric engines, with special trickery providing the illusion of steam. Southport were inspired by that fantastic railway artist Emmett, they built an engine for the festival. Of course, children must have a look to see what builds up the steam, and apparently it's a diet of old rags and fresh air. Yes, Nelly becomes part of the far tottering and Oyster Creek Railway. And who knows, with so many trains being withdrawn to save coal, she may soon be taking her place in relieving those rush hour queues. The railway lasted up until 1953 when its Emmett designed engines were turned into standard miniature locos due to the copyright and ran up until 1972 as part of the fun fair with some minor alterations to its route. And not forgetting the famous Battersea fun fair which took up a large portion of the festival site and lasted for many years after. We'll be covering this in more detail in the next video. Other attractions at the festival included the dance pavilion which was said to be the largest tent of its type in Europe. It had space for over 400 couples and 700 spectators to dance on its oak floor and fancy red carpets. A boating lake and model village 
located within the funfair section. A 1200 seat amphitheater that later became a circus and a children's zoo, which still exists today, although now it's taken over most of the site of the former funfair. The main draw for the festival took place after dark, where illuminations shone all over the site. Fireworks were set off around the lakes and the fountains came to life with spectacular lighting packages. It was meant to symbolize the end of blackout conditions during the war and added to the magical character of the gardens. In the end, the festival was a huge success, attracting over 8 million visitors in its six month run. It was so popular that many of its features and attractions continued long after the festival had ended. Many of the festival features can still be seen in the park today. Some of them have even been restored. So let's head to the park and I'll show you what's remaining today. So here we are on the former site of the festival, which would have been the main walkway right through the park of the festival with giant fountains, cascading fountains and jet fountains right in front of us there, all the way up this central avenue. And the main fun fair was over on the far side over there. And this was pretty much the whole festival site. So while we're here, we are going to take a walk round and see what remains. But just at this section here, used to be a building right where I'm stood now, which would have housed some kind of a cafe or a shop or something. And right behind it was a miniature railway. Now I can't remember the name of it, I'll put it in down below. But it wasn't your average miniature railway. It was a bit of a, a bonkers miniature railway, shall we say. As it used to make its way across here and then head its head down that way on the right and then all the way along the back of the funfair over there. And somewhere around this point was two platforms for the west station of the miniature railway as it headed, it was a terminus here and then it headed around there. But you wouldn't know it today. These paths are pretty much in the original location and I know it made its way from over there and up here. But you just can't see anything today. Again, it's just a flat field with a few undulations in the grass. So who knows what's buried under there as usual. Here we are up on the festival site of the Fountain Basin. And they're not running today, unfortunately. It is too windy. But somebody mentioned a long time ago, the Wandsworth Council that now operate the park, they have restored this a lot compared to what it was in like the 80s and the 90s. So obviously in the 50s, it was glorious. It had all, all the original features here. And then sometime after that, in the, in the next 10, 20, 30 years, it was left to rack and ruin. And it didn't look anything like it. A lot of the, the fountains never worked. The, a lot of litter was in there. It was basically unrecognizable. The council came along and to their due, they did restore it to a certain level without building all the extravagance of the festival. One thing they did do was they copied an original design for the fence off an old picture and they tried their best to replicate it in this and they did a pretty good job including the colour as well. So like I say all these fountains do work but they only run obviously on calm days and during the summer. You can see the pipe work down there for the original or for the nozzles in the fountain. Again I am not sure if these are original, are original pipes, I doubt it very much. I think the old ones got destroyed. And there's some, bound, some Butlins looking fountains over there, right in the middle. They do look very similar to the Butlins ones. And they would be from the 1950s, so probably a similar era. Yeah, it's a shame we can't see it up and running today, but I'm sure you can imagine what it would look like. And I'll try to put a picture in for you, just to give you an idea of what it did look like. Let's head up to the top fountains up here. And just one more shot from a different angle, right in the centre here. I do wonder actually if there used to be a bridge across here because we've got two plinths here on both sides. There's a look at those Butlins looking fountains right there. So we're going to head a bit further up. You can see some original planters here as well which would have housed certain structures and sculptures for the festival. And over there we're looking towards the fun fair. So here we are on the top section and it is looking in a rather sorry state today but like I said it is winter and there's no flowers it's just, and nothing's running so it's going to look like that but that floor in there with the pattern in the middle is the original flooring I am reliably informed a lot of the walls and the stairs are original some of the original decorations around this section 
obviously been restored. They were painted by the looks of it, but a lot of it's peeled off now. And uh, yeah, these basins are full during the summer. We're heading up now to the top section, which was known as the parade. So up here, it runs across the top of the park. So you've got the River Thames on the other side there. So there's like a lower terrace down there, which is the parade, and then a footpath here, which runs all the way down the full length of the park. So it is still a main thoroughfare today in the park. And you can see the Chelsea, or the Albert Bridge over there. But this section on this grassland here, which runs, like I said, all the way down the full length of the park, was used in the festival for merchandise and uh, shopping, basically. So it was like a not usual type of festival where they just displayed things. At this one, you could buy things. So they had actual stalls and sponsors and things like that all the way down here in these little sections within the Greenland here or the, with paths winding through. And this was the central promenade heading straight down the middle and with the main festival site here. Now just off the parade and in this section here was what used to be or was marked on the map as an aviary during the festival. If you just look in there you can see the remains of an old dry stone wall through there. That could have been part of what remains of the building. You can't see much else from here. If I just glance in the trees, there isn't much else to see. There's another wall there as well. So yeah, that looks like it's part of the aviary, or what used to be the aviary. And whilst we're here, I just want to head into the trees around the back of here because there was an old grotto which used to exist in there. Like uh, caves with waterfalls running through it and you could walk through on the inside of this grotto. Now, I, I am told it is completely gone, or it was demolished at some point, but I'm just curious to see, because it's been blocked off in there for many years, if there's anything remaining of that. So let's head round there. Okay, so let's head into these trees, and I can spot something up here already. A couple of rocks here, but there's something a bit more substantial up here. And I think this is the mound the grotto right here. Yes, lots of rocks around. I reckon this is the top of it. So I think we should head down there. So this is down the other side of the mound. Now this looks like it's where it used to be to me. You can see we're in like a ball all around the edge here. All the land is sloped up around the sides all the way around and there's a lovely little winding pathway in here. I think it would have been right in here probably built up here with pathways running through it up to where we were a minute ago, just up there. But there's not much. I'm a bit disappointed that there is nothing here. I thought there might be something apart from a mound. I'll just do one more thing and check around the other side. And there's lots of these suspicious looking rocks here, which are grotto-esque, <laughs> if there's such a word. They're all lining this pathway to the side of where the grotto site is, which I think is just in them trees there, in that little ball. There may have been another entrance here at the top. But the whole pathway is lined with those stones there. So they could be the remnants of the, of the grotto there. So just on this mound behind me, off the main parade here, was what was known as the Guinness Clock. And it was right there in them trees. So just on the edge of the footpath here. I'm going to show you before and after now just to show you what it was. It was basically a clock sponsored by Guinness. And I am told that today it still exists, but not here. It's now at the Guinness factory in uh, Dublin. So with my back to the River Thames, there's the parade that runs across the top end of the park. And right in front of us is the main festival site just over there. But behind me, on this section, which would have been, like I said, filled with shops and things on this middle section here between the Thames and the parade, this beautiful temple here, or pagoda, is absolutely stunning. It's a lot bigger than what you think when you get here. But I am told as well that this is still looked after and cared for by a genuine Buddhist monk who actually lives here. And he's responsible for maintaining this building it's constantly cleaning it and looking after it. But as you can see down here, we've got the River Thames. Again, into central London that way and out of London this way. And, uh, you can get the scale of this 
temple. I have seen this before from the railway bridge and from the river in previous years, and I always wondered what it was. Yeah, it's so much bigger than what you think. So I'm gonna to have to walk away just to get you a full shot of it, it's that big. It's got various levels on it, and uh, I don't think you can get inside, because I just walked all the way around, and there's no staircase into it. There must be a doorway somewhere. Yeah, very large, and it is in immaculate condition. And there's a balcony level at the top as well. So there you go, it's called the London Peace Pagoda. So this is known as the Russell Page Garden. And this again is an original piece of the festival site that has been restored somewhat, but it's not in its original form. This would have been loads of flower beds and gardens and things around here with little sculptures like these ones here. So again, I'm not sure, these are definitely not original, but I'm not sure if they, these were based on a, a replica of a previous sculpture that was here, or whether it was just a new concoction that looks similar. Again, you've got the old style 50s fence in here, which they copied. Well, there you go. I hope you enjoyed our look at the history of Battersea Park, including the Victorian Park and also the festival. Thank you very much for joining us and watching the video. I'll see you next week in the next one. Bye.